Um, hello everyone, it's Lagate, and um, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been quite a while since I uploaded on this channel. And, well, what can I say? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, because I've been occupied with a lot of things, you know, real life things. Then again, I have a lot of the games that I've been playing. And honestly, I felt like I wanted to do something about this game, specifically Victoria 3. Because I've been seeing a lot of things being said about it, and I don't agree with most of them. Let me explain why. The game itself is great. Like, if you have played other games like Factorio, if you have played games like uh, Civilization 5, 4, you know, the micromanagement ones, you will have a great time. Regardless of the war system, if it's not like Hoi 4, or if it's not like Vic 2, it doesn't matter that much, really. And let me start talking about the economy first. Honestly, the economy of this game is way, way better than Victoria 2 in all regards. It actually makes some sense and it actually explains to you what is going on. If you know Victoria 2 in the story that circles around the, the guy that made the economic system for Vicky 2 left <laughs> the company the Paradox in the interactive and they, he left no explanation at all of how it works, that's a good sign that something is very messed up. <laughs> and that's the case for Vicky 2 economy system. It makes no sense at all. And you try to make some sense of it, sometimes your factories are making a huge amount of economy, it makes a lot of profit, and all of a sudden it isn't. It just broke, it breaks out completely. At least allowing Vicky 3, you have some control over it. You know exactly what is going on, you can import, export directly yourself. It's way, way better. And not only better for you, but better for your economy as well. Because you can actually select, import and export your stuff. You don't actually need to wait for like years to build a factory anymore. You don't need to wait years to make a unit, an army. Again, it's just way, way better in that regard. And oh boy, let me talk to you about something. Something about the political system of this game. The political system of this game is actually amazing in way, way better than Victoria 2. Like, if you played Victoria 2 for like an hour, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The rebellions. Like, every single time, like every five minutes, mainly in the late game, every five minutes or so, you have a rebellion rise up. And the worst thing of all is that the rebellion just rises on a unit count way, way higher than you could ever muster in a professional army. How many times I've played stuff like Brazil, Vietnam, the UK, Mexico, and they have like the rebellion, and the rebellion has actually something like 150, 200, even more than that. And if you played Russia, it's over. If you have rebellions, it's over for you. In every five to two years in game time, you change your <laughs> your regime. You become communist, you become fascist, you become a republic, then you become a <laughs> monarchy again. You know what I'm talking about. And in Vicky 3, it's completely different. It actually makes sense. A revolution doesn't happen every weekend, <laughs> like in Vicky 2. Actually, it happened because of the standard of living, if it's dropping, because of some political movement uh, or political action, sorry, that you've taken and you didn't, yeah, the population didn't like, and honestly, it makes way more sense, way more sense, and whatever the revolution pops up, it makes sense also, because it follows the same path, the same pops, the same radicals that they had, so the unit count is somewhat right. No, just somewhat fair. That's the right word that I wanted to say. It's actually fair <laughs> to see the rebellion pop up. It's not like completely random, like it happens all the time in Vicky 2, mainly in late game. And let me talk about it without the technology in the game. You know, not the technology how the game was made, but you know, the tech <laughs> that you actually unlock in game. So, honestly, it's pretty similar to Vicky 2. It's still pretty similar to Victoria 2, and it's still pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it has a lot of depth to it, you have a lot of things that you unlock for your factories, for them to make a lot of products so you can sell them, and you can sell them to your own, pro uh, to your own population, but outside of it as well, you export, again, the economics make sense in this game, and sincerely, the technology spread of the game is also pretty good, it doesn't make you wait 
that long for it to research useful things and it doesn't spread it like Victoria 2 does where it's like five or six tabs of a bunch of technologies that you have to research. No, it's actually more condensed in three of these tabs that you can see on the screen right now, probably. And sincerely, it's just, it just makes more sense, <laughs> really. It's what I'm trying to say here. It's way more uh, uh, sensical in the matter that it can actually help you in the long run. In the long run and the short run as well, because stuff like if you unlock dynamite, you make a lot more iron. If you can unlock that early in the game, you make a lot of cash and your factories actually work better. It's a lot a lot of work but it makes a lot of sense and it's perfect for the game and now i'm going to talk about the controversy of this spooky part of the video because you know everyone is freaking out about this part the war system of the game i will say this you can throw stones at me you can boo me all you want but i will just say it. the war system is good it's not like super in detail in depth, but honestly, it's way, way better than people are talking about it. Sincerely, for someone that is super lazy to micromanage units in games like Hoi 4, this game was a blessing for me, because all I need to do is to just click the general and place it on the front and they will do the job for me. In the meantime, I can just administer the economy of the game, I can actually look for all the stuff and not be so preoccupied about just the war. Because sincerely, if you stop to think about it historically, <laughs> quote unquote, the game uh, wars don't mean that you actually have all of your attention only in the war. Your counter is still running in the background, you still need to run it, the economy, the politics, everything. So yeah. It actually makes somewhat of a sense because the game is sort of telling you hey buddy you don't need to be all focused only in the war you actually have to focus on the rest of your country as well so yeah it's pretty interesting for me what they did it's a pretty interesting concept of war compared to other paradox titles and now the diplomatic plays really that actually also enter in my mind right now it's so, so much better actually than Vicky 2 and I think that they actually missed some opportunities there, really I feel like they've missed stuff like the scramble for Africa, they could add in like a free war goal on all the African minor nations, because honestly it would have been pretty good if you could get in like 1880 to get that free uh, CB like you get in Vicky 2. But then again the game just released, they probably will do something about this in a future DLC or maybe even a free update, I don't know how they're going to conduct this game, so yeah. I think the diplomatic plays right now they have a huge potential. They are already great, but I think they can be better as well. Not only for declaring wars, because honestly, most of the time if you have like an overwhelming amount of force in your army, in your navy, most of the time they will back down and so you don't have to actually go to war for it. It's pretty good, it's for the economy. <laughs> so yeah, I think the war system is pretty okay, it's not the best thing ever of course, but sincerely it's way better than micromanaging hundreds of units in the your country and just waiting and seeing the same thing that people are actually complaining about that I never understood. If you've played Vicky Trade mainly in the late game, you know that it's essentially placing a bunch of uh, 30 units like, you know, four artillery or five artillery, five infantry, an engineer and a hussar in the front line, like that's that uh, 30 unit stack <laughs> that you place in the front line and you just keep reinforcing it forever and ever and ever and it just keeps going. Mainly if you're playing like in World War 1, has France or Germany, you know what I'm talking about, unless like the AI messed up dramatically, which it rarely does, alright? So that's it, essentially. So there you have it, a teeny tiny review for Victoria 3. Is the game good? It depends on you. If you like, like a micromanaging heavy or an army focused game, then this game might not be for you. Actually no, it might not be for you. It isn't for you. Because it won't micromanage your units, you only micromanage your generals and they will go to the front line and they will do the job for you. Same thing can be said about the navy, because they will actually patrol, they will actually, you know, raid convoys, make a naval invasion. 
that sort of stuff. He doesn't like Hoi 4, they actually placed the Navy somewhere for a strike force order or a raid convoy, which actually does <laughs> pretty well or pretty equal to Hoi 4, but still, it's not the same thing as it is in Vicky 2, so be warned about that. Now, if you like me and you like the micromanaged factories, if you like more the nation building part of the game, then yeah, the game is definitely for you. So that's it, thank you for watching, I'm probably gonna make more videos about Vicky 3 because I really enjoyed the game, I got like 70 or 80 hours already, so that's it, thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you soon.